Hello and welcome to my live interview for the Victoria Souls, Souls podcast. Today, I have Cassandra Crawley Mayo with me. She is a woman who was highly successful in corporate America. You know what a task that is. On top of that, she retired early, another huge accomplishment. But she learned in her journey that being successful on the outside is not the same as thriving on the inside. So she's here with us today to share her story and her debut book is Your Way in Your Way. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Danielle Burnock from DanielleBurnock.com. Love yourself from Survive to Thrive, that lady on the internet who loves you. So welcome with me today, Cassandra Mayo. Ah, it's going to be so awesome. Welcome, Cassandra. Thank you for being with me today and for my Victoria Souls podcast interview. I'm so excited to talk with you today. Thank you, Danielle. I'm excited to be here and I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, I mentioned to them, it's your debut book that we're going to be talking about and how you were highly successful in the corporate world mm -hmm. and what a horrendous, wonderful, huge thing that is for a woman nowadays, mm -hmm. or ever, I should say, yeah. and how you also were successful at retiring early, another huge accomplishment. So how did you become so successful? How did you accomplish doing such a huge thing? Well, you know, I, it's interesting because when I graduated from college, I'm going to go back a little bit, and I was never one that knew what I wanted to do. What I knew that I wanted to do was live independently. You know, I wanted to get out of the home with my parents and live on my own. But I, I just said, you know, I'm going to major in something that's flexible, that'll give me an opportunity to kind of have a niche in different areas. So I, measure, I, I actually majored in business administration. And then from that point, so business was the thing, you know, I was uh, managing this, I was hired to manage that. And I was also in an era that I would say mm, integration had just taken place in the town that I lived in. And I'm from a small suburban town in, in Virginia, in what we call the Tidewater area. And I remember interviewing for a job opportunity and the human resources manager gave me a call late one night to tell me that I had, uh, he wanted to offer me this job opportunity. And I'm like, okay, and what might that be? He said, I would like for you to be the general manager at a courtyard hotel. Courtyard Marriott Hotel. And I was like, okay, great. And the, what he immediately said was, thank goodness I met my quota. And I was taken aback with that. And I wow. wasn't quite sure what that meant at that time. But wow. I'm glad that I didn't challenge that because if I knew then what I know now, I probably would have. And I think me being naive set the stage for me to be successful, to give me an opportunity to work in positions uh, as the first African-American female in a lot of the positions that I were in. And I always thought it was a test. And I just thank God that if it were a test, I was a very successful test. And so in other words, I was like the trailblazer for many African-American women that were in my industry. So from that point, I just started moving up. I started uh, doing well, and I'm grateful for that. And I think for me, when I became a general manager at the hotel, I managed the hotel like it was my own. Mm -hmm. And I believe me doing that set the bar because I wanted to make profit. I wanted to have my customers happy. I wanted, um, I just wanted to do well. So I think, you know, being naive, getting out of my way and doing what I was hired to do, I think that has a lot to do with my success and my work ethic was unbelievable. Uh, actually, I was like a hamster, just running, running, <laughs> running, 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 running. And you talking about eight hours a day. I never in my life worked eight hours a day. I always exceeded that. And I'm not going to say I'm proud of that, but that's what I did. So I just worked very long hours and I was a workaholic. Mm. <laughs> that's what I'm going to say. I was a workaholic. 
And was there a reason for that? Uh, yeah, sure. This is what I believe when I look back over my life, I felt that I had to prove myself because I was known as different. And I always thought sometimes I was set up to fail. So I worked hard, harder so that I could, and plus I'm a perfectionist and nobody's perfect. And with that, I just took it overboard and I just worked and I just worked. And I just said, if you can't do it right, don't do it at all. And I say I'm a perfectionist because I grew up in a home where my mother was very critical. Mm. But not that she didn't love me. She loved me dearly, but she criticized me a lot. Anything that I did, I always felt that it wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. So I just strived and worked harder and harder and harder because I wanted to please her. And that particular incident just transferred to me as an adult. Yeah. What happens in our childhood shows up in our adulthood, good or bad. <laughs> Absolutely. It's just we're the product of it. In exactly. Some way. So, and the bad things, we have to process those to get rid of them. And the good ones, we want to nurture those to keep them. <laughs> That's correct. You're exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. So, in your successful corporate life, what did that look like? What are some of the things that you did? Some of the things you enjoyed? Some of your struggles? What, what did that look like? Well, I was always a, a troubleshooter. I was a problem solver and I was always placed in positions where there was opportunities were new. For example, I used to work for Chrysler Credit Corporation when I graduated from, from college. And, and being in that position, I was hired as part of the credit view, I was hired to repossess cars. Ooh, no and <laughs> I actually moved to Birmingham, Alabama, which was a very scary based on all the integration, racism, just a whole lot of things occurred down south. And I was aware of that, but that was my decision. Mm -hmm. And that was my choice to move there because when I was given the, op the opportunity, they asked that I relocate. So I did. I relocated to Birmingham, Alabama. And year, about a year or two later, I got laid off mm. um, and I was devastated because I was so far from home. Yeah. I didn't know what I was going to do. And one of the one of the things that I will share that when I moved there, I had to find a place to live and the places that people showed me, I wouldn't want anyone to live there. Yeah. And the places that I liked, they said they had nothing available. So at that point, I shared that with my manager. And the next day I received a call from some place where I wanted to live. And I was so excited. They called me and told me they just had an availability, a vacancy. And when I went there to find that the entire back of the community was vacant. So in other words, that's when I learned about redlining. Mm -hmm. They felt that I would be a risk because I was an African-American and probably felt that I could not pay my rent. So that was like, welcome to the real world. So things like that happened throughout my career. And wow. it how old me, were you? How old were you in that? Time? I was probably 23, 23, That's pretty young. 24, That's, pretty young. That's a rude reality. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yes. So, you know, so all, every time I would get another position, I would run into things like that. But like I said, that just made me stronger and it just opened the door for, for many others like me. And then from that point in time, because I was in a uh, kind of a management role, all my other positions were in management. I was always in leadership roles. And then from that, I worked at a bank, the largest bank in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. The, actually, it was the largest bank in the state of Alabama that I worked for. And then I left there and I worked for a food service company. And I managed like food service, the cafeteria, housekeeping. So I went through all of those that trajectory and and did that and then from that that's when Marriott acquired that company and that's when I was uh, interviewed to be a general manager from that point and then my career just evolved and evolved and I would say my last uh, opportunity was I was a vice president for client relations for this uh, food service so I would say contracted company 
And then from that point, I just traveled probably 80 to 85%. I traveled to North America. I've been, I can't re recall any states that I've not been to. Wow. So I was just a very busy workaholic person. And I'm just grateful that I was successful in all those positions. Wow. You have really accomplished a lot and done a lot. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. And it sounds like you really loved it for a while. Yeah, I did. But then it came a point that you didn't love it so much anymore, did you? What happened? No, I, you know, I, I did. I loved everything I did. And then, you know, I think as we work in different capacities, as life happens, I call them life interruptions. Mm. You start getting preconceived notions about life experiences. Mm. And so because of the long hours that I worked, um, I, I was, I got burned out. I was burned out before I knew I was burned out. <laughs> I was always tired, uh, traveled a lot. Oh my goodness. You know, I, a lot, I would call my, the, my office would be at the airport. I'd go to the airport, get a spot and do the work that I had to do because when I would go to different states or cities, I had work to do there and I wanted to be present with my clients or people that I was working with. And I just, I was just burnt out and I just felt that there was something else for me to do. And, you know, you've heard, many people have heard this saying, people don't leave the jobs, but they leave the people that they work for. And I started encountering individuals that I reported to that were very critical of things that I had done. And because I had been in leadership positions, I know how one can sabotage employees that they're not that fond of. Mm. And I was able to detect that. And it was like, you know, it was kind of like, you know, by me working in what I would call the, uh, what would I call this? In an environment where I was the only one and if I were to make a comment or give an opinion or provide feedback, it was like I wasn't listened to. But another person could say the same thing that I said, and they may have said it differently, but they said the same thing. And it was like they listened to them, but they ignored me. And I think Ouch. just that type of behavior just wore me out. And, you know, and I was, you know, I always say don't burn your bridges because you may have to cross over them. So I was very astute on how to respond and present what I felt was happening to me. But when you do that, you still have to be very, very careful because they will retaliate. They will retaliate. I know that because I have mentored so many women and men. And, uh, and I just, I'm just grateful for all that experience because of what that has taught me is I do not want to be like many of them. Oh, so, well, yeah. So with that, I have been become very humble, but I just was burnt out and I just felt mm -hmm. that there was something else in my life that I should be doing. And that, and, you know, and, and, and what I did was I supported the organization's bottom line, you know, and I realized that money played an integral role in so many things, you know, because you had to make a profit in your organization. And I understand that, but for the sake of not treating others nicely, I don't, I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you were unhappy for a while though, weren't you? How long did you stick it out and, and how did you survive through that time when these people are doing these awful things? I, I, I can appreciate that. I've been in situations where you speak and you get ignored and, mm -hmm. and they listen to someone else and, and it's very, it's painful. <laughs> yeah. And you know, what, what I think the good that came out of that is I started acquiring a relationship with God. Um, I would not have been successful without him. So when you're going through all these challenges and problems, you can talk to people, but that wasn't giving me the solace that I needed. So I started attending church and it wasn't so much the church, but I started building a relationship with God. And then many people want to know, well, how do you do that? So I spent time with them, just like I have relationships with other people in my life. You have to spend time with them. So I just did a lot of reading. I went to a lot of um, um, Christian events. 
And I started uh, doing workshops because I did workshops on my job. And that gave me what I needed. And it just built me and made me strong. And I was able to see how his word would come to pass. You know, for example, your, your, um, I will make your enemy your footstool. And I will use, I will share this piece. I was working in a capacity where I was being trained by other managers. And one of the managers told me that he thought that as a woman, it would be difficult for me to be in a, at a level and overseeing a whole lot of people. It would just be a big challenge for me based on his observations. And I said, really? Now this was a white guy. And, but what happened is once I got promoted, he reported to me and uh, probably about a month later, he resigned. So that's when I, you know, that, that's when I use that scripture. God says, I'll make your, my, your enemy, your footstool and vengeance is mine. So I just continue to be who I was created to be and do unto others like I'd like them to do unto me. And I just observed things that happen as a result of not being nice to me, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. so to speak. So that's how I, I survived just by the relationship that I had uh, with God and just being in tune. And it just gave me the strength that I needed to keep, keep it moving. Well, how long did you stay there? You retired early and then you got to a point where it said you got, you said you got sick and tired of being sick and tired. Did that happen before you retired or after you retired? And it actually happened before, I think about five years before I retired, you know, I would come in and out, you know, I would be like, mm, I know there's something else for me to do, but yet I would get stuck and I didn't know what that was. And I would, you know, so, you know, I would go even keel and things were great for a month or two or three or four. And then there's another moment when I'm like, I know there's something else to do. And I just didn't know what to do, you know, and, and one of the things that I realized because I was not happy anymore or at peace of mind, I didn't think it was fair to work in an environment for someone when you couldn't give them your all. I used to give 120% and I was down to like 90%. And, and that's when I discovered that in the beginning of my career, I set goals. And one of the goals I set is I wanted to retire at age 55. And what I didn't realize is when I was just at my tipping point, I was turning 55. And I said, oh my gosh, maybe... I could, I will retire. So I kind of looked at my finances to see what I was able to. And I retired at the age of 55. And that's the beauty of setting a goal, right? And I accomplished that. So that was a big accomplishment for me. Yes. Yeah. So how did you get out of that striving that you said that you didn't know what was next? So after you retired and how did you start to thrive? What did you take ownership? How did you start to thrive? I mean, you thrived successfully on the outside, but you said you had been, you know, miserable on the inside as you were going through. There's got to be something more that's stuck. I'm sure people listening are going, yeah, I, I can relate to that whole stuck thing. I'm mm -hmm. fine for a while, for five minutes, and then I'm stuck again. And that, that repetitive thing, it, it gets very tiresome yeah. to yeah. do that. But how did you get out of that that cycle of, uh, 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 like well, riding on a flat tire. <laughs> yeah. It's like when I was kind of going through my peaks and valleys, there was something inside of me called a book. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just felt that I wanted to write this book and I had an epiphany one evening at a hotel, at an airport. And, in your office. <laughs> yeah, at my office. And I actually talked about this in my book and I call it an out of body experience. And, you know, by me spending so much time at the airport, I was very familiar about everything about <laughs> yeah. flights, you know, people, uh, weather, tarmac, hotels. I mean, I was just, it was just crazy. But this particular time, the flight was was I, I had a flight, I think it was about three o'clock. And to make that long story short, 
the flight was coming, that it was late, de delayed due to weather. Then another time it was mechanical difficulties. And then about 10.30 PM, it was canceled. And it was a full flight and the people went bizarre. I have never ever seen a bunch of people at 10.30 at night in Washington, DC. They were hungry, they were tired. Half of them were not frequent travelers. They had no idea what to do. And that was a moment in time that I looked around and I said, if somebody doesn't do anything, this is not going to be a pretty picture. I didn't know whether the police were coming or security were coming, but it just got to be very chaotic. It was like a war zone. Wow. And what I did was I had my observation and then I went over to the agents and asked them some questions about, okay, so... All right, the flight's canceled. So what are you going to do? What do you all usually do? What's the protocol? Is there any hotels that are available? Any vouchers for to re recovery? So I had a set of questions that I asked the agents. And then mm -hmm. once they shared with me what it was that I needed to hear, I took their microphone and I made the announcement and I shared with them, um, you know, based on what I knew, to form a line. If anybody was interested in a hotel, I want you to stand in this line. Anybody interested in uh, re rescheduling, booking your flight, stand in this line. So I had got, it was chaos to order. And once I did that, I um, it got so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. And people just looked at me and I was so skittish, I sort of tiptoed back to my seat. <laughs> and I stayed there until everybody was taken care of until 2 a.m. in the morning. Wow. And I had a gentleman come over to me and say, ma'am, what you did was amazing. And I was like, really? And then there was a voice in my head that said, if you get out of your way, I could do some mighty things for you. And I was like, that's weird. It kept coming back and forth. So anyway, I finally went to had my hotel, came back that morning and was applauded. People remembered me. And wow. I was like, oh, wow. And then again, if you would get out of your way, I can do some great things with you. So in other words, we have self-imposed barriers. I knew I had a skill that could make a chaotic place a peaceful place. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than arguing and being mad and having a headache and my blood pressure going up, I just took over now. And it wasn't my business to take over. Now, if it were my own business, I would do that. But it was definitely not something that I should have stepped in, I thought and did. So that's the day that my life somewhat turned around because I discovered something that, number one, I was ashamed to take over, you know, but I did. Number two, it wasn't my business. So why was I going to intervene and take their mic and tell people what to do? Uh, number three, I had the skill set. I knew, you know, that you can that, you know, when you're late or delayed, there are hotels in the area. I knew that, you know, so can they stay at a hotel? I also knew that people hadn't eaten. Do you have vouchers? So there were just certain things that I knew to take care of those individuals that were at that airport. And that's when. I, this book came out and says, wow, is your way in your way? And that was the beginning of the title of my book. And then when that occurred, then I started having more meaning and realizing that, you know what? I think this is what I should be doing. I should be working and writing and talking about how self-imposed barriers prevent us from living our life to the fullest. And it, it's, it's nonsense to me that we have though. I mean, it's not nonsense that we have self-imposed barriers. It's just that we have so much to give to the world, but we stop that because of our past or we think we're too old or we think we don't have the skill, whatever we think is something that's preventing us from moving forward to what it is that we really want to do with our lives. And I just came to a point, well, I'm, I'm through with that. I'm going to do whatever that I can do to, to change the trajectory of a lot of individuals so that they can live their lives to the fullest. 
And the reason I can do that, because I wasn't living my life to the fullest. So if I can live my life to the fullest, anybody can live their life to the fullest. And that's, that's my mission. Wow. That sounds like a perfect segue into something we mentioned at the beginning about Shawshank. Yes. Because I had just been to Shawshank this, this last Friday and about Andy and how Andy got to that point and read and they, that conversation that they had sitting on the ground next to the prison and how Red didn't think he could survive outside of there. And Andy was like, he just had this motivation. He had this hope. He had this burning thing in him. And why don't you share how you relate to that with your book? Cause you referenced that in your book. So elaborate on Shawshank in your book Yeah, and your uh, motto and how that, that, that speaks to you. Yeah, my my mantra now is live your best life. And it's not a cliche. And mm -hmm. I wrote in the preface of my book about the movie, The Shawshank Redemption. I love that movie. <laughs> and as you indicated, Andy and Red, and I don't, many of your listeners may not have seen it, but I encourage you to take a look at it. Oh, they will yes. both pause here to say, if you have not watched Shawshank Redemption, <laughs> Get it on Netflix or whatever streaming service you got. Buy the DVD, whatever you go to the library. I mean, you can get it <laughs> and watch that movie. It is it is powerful. It is a very powerful book. And, you know, and their mantra was, which was Andy's mantra was, you know, Red, you, you either have to get busy living or get busy dying. So in other words, when I heard that and when I saw the movie, it's like you have to be intentional. Mm -hmm. about what it is that you want. Yeah. And, and Andy was intentional about living his life to the fullest. So I don't want to do a spoiler alert for those who've not seen it. So I won't tell you what happened, but you need to see what happened. And he was determined that he was going to do what he always wanted to do, what he dreamed of doing in spite of being in prison, in spite of those self-imposed barriers, in spite of those walls that people put up, in spite of what people tell you you can't do. Right. He far exceeded that. And you know, what he did was he got busy living. He made up his mind, either I'm going to live, I'm going to die, and I am going to live. And, and that did it in so is... many ways in the movie, too. Uh -huh. As I'm listening to you, I have flashes of different scenes. It's not just how the movie ends, but it's also the things that he does in the middle with the library and with the warden and, you know, the letters that he wrote and, and mm -hmm. the things that he did for his fellow inmates and stuff it just That's right. he was busy living his best life even though he did not belong there exactly <laughs> he and was there he was falsely accused I, i'll spoil that one okay thing, they, that that's something that comes out super early in that yeah he was not he was not guilty of that but he was in there yet he made the best of it and that we can do no matter what hand we get dealt everybody gets dealt a hand some people get aces some people get deuces you know, and some people, they get wild cards, but no matter what we get, if we are determined to play the hand well and live our best life, we can make a good life. That's right. And another observation for those who are going to watch it is he had the skills when he got there. Mm -hmm. He had the accounting, the numbers. There were so many things he could do that he learned to do. That was part of his DNA, his dominating natural ability. And he used those just like all of us that are watching have skills, we have gifts. And what he did was he just used them in the midst of what he was going through. He didn't just not put them aside, he excelled on it. He catapulted, a matter of fact. And because of that, that allowed him to start to live that joyful life. Yeah, I like that dominating natural ability, how you did that with the DNA. I really like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. So tell us more about your book, more about your book. And you said how it came to be is because it just kind of started rising up in you from that airport situation where you had your epiphany and how getting out of your way. Share more about your book with us, please. Yeah, you know, the, the book is- and Hold up is, your book and, and tell us yeah. what you just give a subtitle. And I do. The book is, it's titled, Is Your Way In Your Way? <laughs> Got some kids over? <laughs> That's my fur baby. 
I mentioned my fur baby and my fur baby is crying in the background. Oh, at first it sounded like little kids, but now I, I hear that. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> so you need her to come in the room with you so she stops crying? No, I just need her to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, she, us and, she's, and he's not in the room with me. He's far away, but he's getting loud <laughs> in a cage. Okay, it's, this is the book, and it's a self-discovery guide for women on how to restore your life, learn from your experiences, and be your true self again. The book is really about my story. You know, I put my pieces in it because I know for a fact that many of the audience will find themselves in these stories. Mm -hmm. And there were certain self-imposed barriers that prevent all of us or many of us from living our life to the fullest. And so what I decided to do is write love letters to women. So this is a book of love letters. And for example, I have, first of all, I have your backstory because that's where it all begins. So I talk about my backstory and in each letter, I talk about the key messages based on the content of each love letter. And then also I write what's a key scripture that will correspond with the content of the letter. And that's how the whole book is set up. So, so actually the first chapter is after the preface, but it's about my, well, the first chapter is Oh, you went mute. <laughs> so that individuals will know how it all started. And then mm -hmm. I talk about dear women who are in your own way. And I use your backstory because it all starts with your backstory. Mm -hmm. And then from that point, I talk about welcome to the real world, because after <laughs> we've lived with our parents or guardian, it's time for us to go out on our own. So mm -hmm. what happens there? What did you expect? You know, when you went out there, like, wow, a rude awakening, I'm sure. And then I have about um, dear women who have experienced racism, and inequality. And then I talk about dear women who compare themselves to mm -hmm. others, you know, dear women who have esteem battles that wear masks. Now, all of these barriers prevent us from moving forward. I even yeah. talk about women with physical and mental challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, what, 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 what about all of these things that prevent you from moving forward? And I basically talk about how do you mitigate them? Mm -hmm. so that you can move forward. And then I talk about dear women who wears, who has scars and resentments because those scars and resentments is definitely something that could just stop you in your tracks. Oh, yeah. And later on in life, you realize, oh my gosh, because I read this article about, um, um, it was a hospice nurse by the name of Bonnie Ware. And one of the things she did was interview hospice patients. And there were five themes she came out of from that. And she even wrote a book about it. And two of those really bothered me. And one of those was there were people that wished they had been happier in their life. Now, these are people transitioning. And as they look back on their life, this is what they regret. Wow. And then there were people that says, I just wish I could have been more true to myself. And when I hmm. heard that, I'm like, happy like oh my gosh people are i mean it was just amazing how people wish they were happier and they wish they could have been true to themselves so mm -hmm. i'm like wow that's a sad case because see when i die when it's time for me to go i want to go and for god to say well please well done my faithful servant because i also heard a minister talk about the richest place in the world is the graveyard and because of that, that is there's so many people that die with unmet dreams. And I am determined from this day on that I will not die with unmet dreams. And I am on a mission. So no one will die with unmet dreams because Amen. you, because you definitely have a purpose. You definitely are put here for something, you know, and I know that even though I may have been successful and I did well, you know, there were people that looked up to me and compared themselves to me and wanted to be like me. And I always said, no, you don't. 
You don't want to be like me. You want to be like yourself because you don't know what it took me to get to where I am. And you don't know what's behind this mask that I've been wearing for many, many years. So the mask now has come off. I am true to myself and I am grateful for that because now as I look back over my life, I now know why I went through what I went through so that I could be a blessing to others. And also, you know, I talked about, Dear women who've lost a loved one, I know people that lost loved ones and they're not out of it yet. They're still grieving. And I know what that's like. I'm an only child and I lost both of my parents, one in September and one two years ago. Mm. And another regret that I found for people that lose their loved one, no one knows what their wishes are. And then at the end of their life, there's family drama. There are people that, especially if there are assets involved, Sally wants mom this and Billy says, no, I want mom for this. But if mom and dad or your loved ones share what their end of life wishes were, then life, it would be so much easier. It would hurt. But that's something that you don't need to deal with. So I talked about that and I talked about, you know, a letter to women who are confused about their purpose in life. You know, how many years have I said, well, what is my purpose? Well, what what should I be doing? You know, so there's no big purpose and there's no little purpose. Amen. You know, yeah. You know, if it's to take care of your children, that is a job and that's a purpose. If it's to yes. take care of your parent, yeah. you know, that that's something that's your that's your purpose at that time. So, you know, um, and yet, think- like you said, at that time, you can have yes. purposes at different times. I talk about helping people to embrace their God-given greatness. And when people hear purpose and greatness, they tend to think of like humongous things. That's right. Like this gentleman I know who climbs Mount Everest and he's climbed all the peaks on all the continents and he's done all these amazing, huge things. But not everybody's going to do those. And that's okay. That is. And I share the story of a dear friend of mine I lost a, a little over a year ago. And one of her, her greatness things to me was she could give you a hug that would make all your troubles melt away. Mm -hmm. And I tell that because that was greatness. I mean, it wasn't the only thing she did, but I want to draw the picture that it doesn't have to be huge and it can change. Like you said, for a season, you take care of this for a season and then you do this other thing. There is purpose. There is promise in us. There is greatness in us because we're created in the image of God. We're, we're amazing creatures and we're always in process. (laughs) You are so right. And, you know, and I, in my book, I talk about a phlebotomist and I'm a, what we call a hard stick. If you need to get blood from me, it is not easy. Right. (laughs) And I remember going to a phlebotomist. I'll never forget her. I have never, ever had someone stick me and get the blood just that quick. I loved her. And you know, from this day forward, before I make an appointment, I make sure she's going to be on duty. That's her purpose for me because I'm just traumatized over people sticking me to get blood because yeah. it's hard. So yeah, my mother-in-law was like that. She real yeah. hard to get blood. My husband's like that too. Yes. And it really is quite a thing. And see, that's that's not a huge Mount Everest thing, but it's a huge thing to you. That is exactly. a greatness that she has that not every phlebotomist has. And for those who don't know what that is, it's someone who deals with blood. <laughs> right. That's right. Draws your blood. That's correct. That's correct. Um, you know, so that that's my, um, and, and you know, and another thing, I remember when I had completed writing my book and I was like, okay, so, you know, it's kind of like, let's say you, you figured out your purpose and you do it. And he's like, okay, I'm done. And then what? It's like like retiring from life. Yeah. Like, so now what? I mean, what's next? And, and I was like, what's next? You know, never put the cart before the horse with me. God knows me because if I had, I wouldn't have written the book. And he (laughs) said, I think it's time for you to turn your book into a business. I'm like, a what? So that's what I did. You know, I, I have a business and like I said, my, my mantra is living your best life. And I have a blueprint that helps individuals get to that point along with resources that they need in order to live their best life. So I'm really excited about that. Um, because if you think about it, you know, hopefully once this, this podcast is over, people may stop and say, Hmm, what is it? What, what do I need to do to live my best life? Who thinks about that? 
I mean, mm-hmm. what is it? And some people don't even know. And then some people are like, oh, okay. So let's talk about that. And let's take a deep dive. But part of my framework is we dive into your backstory. Because once you get to your backstory and you start jotting down what it takes, what your best life look like, then there are barriers that's preventing them from getting there. And that's what we talk about. What are those barriers? And then from that, we strategize. And then another thing that we're not very good at is we don't acknowledge our accomplishments. You know, somebody says, oh my gosh, you did great. Like, really? I did? Or, or that's a beautiful outfit. You, I've had that outfit for years. You know, I got that from a consignment shop. You know, it's just... Dismissing themselves, diminishing themselves. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I want that part because we so we always focus on the negative. We don't focus on what's good. And we need to focus on what's good because there Amen. is a lot of good, particularly what's going on in our world today. Amen. We need to do that. There's a lot of negative out there. It'd be so it easy. really is. suck down the whole like flushing the toilet and going down. It really is. No with intention that's I have a jar right here behind me called my good things jar every day <clears throat> in the morning I write one good thing from the day before and it's a day of it's a way of starting my day with positive positive. and right. I look at yesterday and sometimes I can come up with you know just one sometimes it's a whole bunch but I only want write one thing down because I do it for a whole year and then on New Year's Day I dump them out and I read them all Nice. And it's just, it's a way to celebrate all that yes. good. So however anyone wants to focus on the good, whether a journal, a good things jar, or however you unveil that in your book, focusing on the positive is a good intentional thing to do. It and before really we, we tie this up, what is something you want to make sure that, that our audience hears from you? Cassandra, well, what is, you, you want know, to leave our audience with? Yeah, <laughs> I like for every individual listening to think about their personal board of directors. In organizations, there's a board of directors. And those individuals are placed there because they have the best interests of the company at heart. So they all have different skill sets. So I always say association brings about assimilation. So think about who's in your circle. Because I, you know, I used to say, if you tell me who's in your Zelle account or your cash app, I can tell you what you're going to accomplish. If you tell me who your friends are, I can pretty much tell you your future. So what I mean by a personal board of directors, for example, and I'll share mine. I have a a, a person that's a financial person that's really good with numbers. And I didn't go out and like pick them. It's just who am who's in my circle? Who am I surrounded with? So when I have these big questions like the stock market now, what's going on? I've invested in that. What should I do? I call them. I actually have someone in my circle that's an attorney, you know, and these are people, and I and I will say this, but do not underestimate the power of relationships you have in your life. Amen. So I have an attorney. I also have a friend that helps me keep it real. You know, you're too serious. Let's straighten up. Let's have some fun. I have a friend like that. I have a spiritual partner friend. If I'm thinking about, or I'm upset about something, or I want to do something, or I'm angry, I call them and say, now, I don't think this is fair. And then the first thing he'll do is take me to the word. Now, what did God say? So I have one of those, right? Like, what did God say? I'm like, oh boy, okay. So I can't do that, right? <laughs> you know, and, and yeah, so it's just amazing. So I just have certain people in my surroundings that have my best interest at heart, not a yes ma'am or a yes man or yes woman, but somebody that would challenge me because if everybody, if I know more than anybody in my group, I need to find another group. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know it all. So I just want people there. Like I have a a mentor and I have a coach in mind, you know, so I just have, and that's part of my framework or my blueprint for my business that I have because people need this. And I also have what I call an accountability partner. We meet weekly. Sometimes we don't meet weekly, but we set our goals and we hold each other accountable when we meet and we kind of go through it and talk about it. And that just keeps keeps me very, very focused. So, and I also say, you know, mental health is big. Mental health has been big for years, trust me. No one talked about it until recently. 
-hmm. And it is off of the chain. And the reason I know about that, because I suffered with depression, but I wouldn't dare tell anyone back in the day, but I went to a therapist and a whole lot of people suffer with it. And as a result of it, even our life expectancy has diminished. At one time, I think it was like 80 something. It has gone down to 78 years old that people will die now. You know, people are just depressed. They're getting, they're stressed out. They're, they're sick. So I have that in my circle, somebody that I can go to and talk to about challenges that I am having in my life. So that's what I'd like to leave to just be cognizant of who's in your circle. Wonderful. And so how can people connect with you and where can they get your book? Sure. My book, actually, I, I, my website is CassandraCrawley.com. My, um, all my social media platforms are Cassandra Crawley Mayo. And one of the things I did not share with the audience, once I kind of got in a good place, I got married. And, And I say that because that was part of my journey because I always wanted that special someone in my life. And while working, I didn't have that. Mm. I didn't have the right people in my life. I'll say that. And then once I started mellow, I would say in my zone, so to speak, then I met someone. And um, so I'm relatively, I'm a newlywed. Actually, I still call myself a newlywed, but Cassandra Crawley Mayo, I'm online and, and you can get my book on my website. I also have blogs on blogs to help you get out of your way, CassandraCrawley.com. And of course it's on Amazon. Okay. as well, Barnes and Noble. And I'm working on my Audible and my Audible will be coming out shortly. Wonderful. That's exciting. People like audiobooks. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, thank you so much for sharing today, Cassandra. It was great. It's a, so you. much. We, we got off on other things and I love when that happens. We I have this framework, but we just get to talking and yeah. love talking about all the Shawshank stuff too, because yes. people can live their best life if they will be intentional. So connect with Cassandra. When this resonates with you, grab a copy of her book, connect with her. Are you on the different socials too? I am. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. And I'm not on TikTok yet, but I have my my girlfriend's children say I need to be on TikTok. (laughs) All righty. Well, thank you for sharing with everyone today and connect with Cassandra. And just, I appreciate you, Cassandra. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. Thank you guys for coming and for listening. Until next time, I'm Danielle Burnock from DanielleBurnock.com. Love yourself from Survive to Thrive, that lady on the internet who loves you.